All right, folks, as promised, we are going to get started um, right here at the top of the hour. Uh, I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us uh, for today's webinar. We have a really great topic lined up for you today, but before I get into that, uh, introductions are in order. My name is Greg Dorio. I work with the Ativo Group. Uh, for those of you that don't know who Ativo is, we are a McCola reseller based out of Orange County, California. Uh, we do have resources spread out around the country, however. Uh, and we've been in the McCola world since 1992. Uh, collectively on our team, uh, we have well over 150 years of experience dealing with exact McCola software. And uh, we're committed to providing our customers with the best possible training and user experience. And twice a month, we open up that training to the uh, greater McCola community through these informational webinars. Uh, today's topic is one that we've been asked about a lot by our clients and that is how to keep McCola running smoothly. As you can see from the slide on your screen, this is part one of a series on this specific topic. Uh, there is honestly just way too much information to cover in just one 45-minute session. Uh, today we're lucky enough to be joined by John Brennan and Charmaine, Sh Charmaine Schaefer, also of the Ativo Group, who will be doing today's presentation. Uh, both John and Charmaine previously worked for Exact McCola, and if my math is correct, they have between them, nearly 30 combined years working with Exact before joining the Ativo team. So they really are experts when it comes to this software. Uh, we're going to get to the presentation started in just a second, but before I do, I want to cover a few logistical items. Today's presentation should be about 45 minutes long with time at the end for Q&A. If you do have a question during the presentation, you can use the chat feature on the webinar dashboard. I will be monitoring that personally and we'll make sure we get to all of those questions at the end. Once the presentation is over, I will also open up everyone's phone lines so we can have a more open discussion. I just ask that if you don't have any questions, you keep yourself, uh, your phone self-muted so we aren't overwhelmed by background noise. Uh, we are also recording this webinar and that link should be available by tomorrow afternoon, Monday at the latest. Um, and we also can provide the slide deck to anyone who asks for it. Uh, with that little intro out of the way, uh, why don't we go ahead and take a look at today's agenda. John, if you want to get us over to the next slide. So as you can see, we have a lot to cover today. Um, the first three topics will be uh, taken by John. Uh, that's you know, resetting allocations and on-order quantities, using deferred processing, um, clearing work files, and then we'll have uh, handed over to Charmaine who will touch on rebuilding batch IDs, uh, removing phantom users, and the file validation process. Um, as you can probably tell, user, people familiar with Nicola, this obviously it doesn't cover everything. Uh, we will definitely have a part two of this series probably in the first part of February, so keep your eyes peeled for that. And then as I said, once we get through um, all the main topics, we will have an open forum for Q&A. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and shut up and let the experts dive in. Uh, John, if you want to get us started, the floor is yours. Very good. Thank you very much, Greg. A couple of things we want to talk about when we talk about how we're going to make uh, help uh, McCullough run smoother and run more efficiently for you. A couple of things we're going to talk about, at least initially, and the first one is resetting allocations and on order quantities. Uh, as the picture indicates, quantity available has to be correct. I rely on those numbers. Well, how do we make sure that they stay correct? Whether it's a quantity on order or the allocations by orders, how do we make sure that it, that, that it stays the way it's supposed to stay? Well, we can do that in a couple of ways. We have the ability to reset our allocations and also reset our on order quantities. So we might want to figure out what causes the problem between the allocations and the on-order quantities by item. And many system activities can create allocation or on-order problems, such as if you're canceling a line, for instance, on an order, or you close a partial order, you put something into history for a purchase order. You might have incorrect items set up if you're looking for allocations from, from an OE manufactured item. You might have the manufacturing method and stock flag changed or incorrect because there are a number of different ways that we generate allocations, and those are just a few of them. When they get out of whack, there's something that you need to do, and what you need to do is reset those allocations. It is a problem because when we're looking for an available quantity, we can't really tell if we have the available to promises correct. The customer service issue arises because now we can't tell our customers whether or not we have the product available to them, put them in an order, or whether it's going to be back ordered, and also the allocations drive purchases in production. So if, I'm, if I have an allocation and a requirement, an allocation is a requirement, 
I want to make sure that I'm able to satisfy that requirement whether I need to purchase or produce the item. Now, when do we want to do this? We suggest that this is performed on a regular basis. When I say a regular basis, there are individuals who want to process who want to process this daily. Minimum you want to do it on a monthly basis because you can never tell how the information got a whack and how you're going to fix it. Normally, you'll probably wind up doing it weekly, and that, like I said, there are some individuals, some organizations that we currently deal with that actually process your reset allocations and your on-order quantities on a daily basis. So let's just take a real quick look at how we reset our how we reset our allocations and our on-order quantities. The first thing is we're gonna we're gonna navigate to the to the um, utility section distribution, inventory management, and reset allocations. And when, it, when that screen comes up, you're going to be seeing a screen like this. The reason that I put this up here was because there's two ways to run this application. First of all, we can run it with the box, box reset inventory transaction as unchecked. What that allows us to do is it allows us to determine whether or not we have allocations that are out of order, that are out of whack. If we, if we select print errors only, that's the green box, in EM10, we don't have that, opt uh, that, that uh, opportunity as far as progression is concerned. We're able to select print errors only, and the report will be limited only to those items where the allocations are incorrect. The same settings work as far as progression is concerned, but we don't have the print error only selection. This allows you to do again is to determine whether or not we need to even run the reset allocations. If we get a reset allocation report, and this is when we're printing the report out without uh, without the uh, box checked, and we ran it with print errors only, no errors were found, the message indicates that all of the allocations for the items and locations selected are correct, and you don't need to run a reset. If you were to run this daily and you simply run the report daily and find that there are no or errors found, you don't need to reset your allocations, and that means that all of the orders that you have are appropriate and contain all of the information between between the transaction and the item. So reset allocations, once we find that that's not correct, once we need to find that we need to do that, we're going we're gonna to need to actually reset those transactions, and we'll see how we do that in just a minute. The same thing is true with the reset on order quantity. If we don't check the reset inventory transaction box, it'll give us all the information necessary in a report, and we can review that report to determine the on order quantities. One of the things I should have pointed out was that the uh, allocations quantity is driven by the orders, on order quantity is, der is uh, derived from your purchase orders, production orders, uh, pop orders, etc. So we want to leave the reset inventory transaction box unchecked to get that report. And again, if we review the report and we find that we don't have any problems, all of our all of our uh, transactions tie out. We really don't need to run the reset on order quantity. Let's take a look at a reset on order quantity report that shows that we do have an error. We have an error on production order number 34. We can actually go in and find that error and correct the error itself. And on a typical order, the error condition exists and we're able to see where it exists. You'll note that we have our quantity on order shows as 12, line quantity on order shows 12, transaction quantity on order shows 14. Well, we can readily identify the item that caused the problem. We can actually go in and create, fix that problem on the order if, in fact, it is a problem with the order. Or, if we want, we can actually reset the on-order quantity. And correcting the problem identified in the report can clear the order without a reset, or we can go and reset the on-order quantity process, which will do that for us. Running the reset on order process, we want to use a reset on order process to correct any and all order quantity errors on the system. When I say order, on order is the production order, pop order, et cetera. The, the acquisition rather, that, rather than the demand. So we want to make sure that we turn on the reset inventory transactions block. We want to make sure it's run with exclusive access to the system. That means everybody else needs to be out. You don't want to be running this when there's anybody else in the system. And also, we want to consider using the deferred processing to run this process. You might want to run it at night. You might want to run it daily, weekly, monthly, et cetera. Let's talk about the reset allocation process. So we're going to go out and grab all of the orders that have a requirement that demand us to provide, uh, to, to provide items to that order. And it could be an order entry. It could be a demand for a production order, a pop order, et cetera. And the process is pretty much the same. We want to reset our inventory transaction after we've run the report. 
we want to make sure we check the on reset inventory transactions box. And again, we need to be sure that we have exclusive access to the system. And finally, we want to consider again using the deferred process to run this. Now let's take a look just a little bit at, uh, at uh, using deferred processing. Do we want to run it now or do we want to run it later? So deferred processing is a built-in utility in all versions of McCola, and it allows for certain processes or reports to be run at a scheduled time. We determine when we want those processes or reports to run, what time we want them to run, and the frequency in which we want them to run. And it also facilitates scheduled unattended processing. So uses for deferred processing. We want to reset allocations and non-order quantities, which is something we just talked about. It's perfect for times when there's no one using the system. Generally speaking, you'll probably be doing that uh, if it's a if it's a two or one or two shift operation. You'll probably be doing that at night, set it for 10:30, 11 o'clock at night, and have the process run. And actually, it can be used for regularly regenerating MRP, running reports to disk or paper on schedule, and also during your month-end processing. Set up deferred processing, you want to select a process or report to be run, so reset inventory transactions, which is what we just saw and what we just looked at. Next, we want to use deferred processing. We want to select the output disk or printer, check on the defer printing, and click OK. When we click on the defer printing, what we're really saying is we don't want to print this out right away. Complete the deferred print options, assigning a start date, a start time, and a batch ID, description and recurring code, one time, daily, weekly, or monthly, as I had mentioned. And then we select and we click OK. Monitoring deferred processing, and we recommend that deferred processes are reviewed weekly to ensure that they're working. You can find that by going to the list of deferred processes, and you can go in and take a look and find out which ones have run and how long it took to run them. One of the reasons is you might want to check on them on a periodic basis if it's important that they, that they be run on a daily or a weekly basis, you might want to make sure that you check it only because when you have server reboots or any other system issues, system related issues, it can interrupt your deferred processing. So you really need to check that. You really need to make sure that, uh, that the process hasn't been, hasn't been interrupted. The actual the application needs to stay running in order for it to work. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about clearing work files. One of the things we're talking about clearing work files, or what, what really are work files? Well, work files are temporary files that are created during the processing, pro during processing. As I'm creating there, each individual work file, and there are a number of them, and we'll see a couple of them, are generated and created and then cleared out once the process is complete. The work files don't necessarily just work for one process. There could be a number of processes attached to each of the individual work files. And those are usually in the name contained the WRK and possibly a 999 or sequential number as far as the work files is concerned. Normally what happens is the work files are purged or deleted when the process is complete. So once I've completed the process, the work file disappears. And if you were to go into the SQL table and you need to take a look, you should find only the null line or the null row, nothing should be in that file. Occasionally it doesn't happen and sometimes problems can result. And it should contain no information unless there's an active process running that uses the table. Well, that's, it's good to know, good to know where they are. But what causes those unwanted work files? Well, a couple of things, and I'm sure we've all dealt with some of these. Uh, impatience probably is one of the big deals. Using Control-Alt-Delete to stop a process or stop something. Any corrupted transactions that might be still in the work file, a system or application crash which interrupts the process in its middle and all the information remains in the work file, and closing out of a process before it's complete. And I think we've all seen that uh, when, when it's taking an awful long time for the process to run. So he says, well, this can't be right. I need to get out of here and I'm going to do a control alt delete or I'm going to shut the system down, etc." All the information that went into the work file for that process that hasn't been cleared out will not be automatically purged and you're actually going to need to go in and clear that out. A lot of times what will wind up happening is you, it's going to cause slow processing of process failure and even incorrect distributions. I have information in the work file that hasn't been cleared out, that hasn't been processed completely. It can cause any number of different errors. What, this is one of those things that can actually make your information work better and faster. 
So when do we want to fix this particular problem? Well, we want to make sure that everyone is out of the system. And as with most of what it is that we talk about, we want to make sure there's a, a good backup. Anytime we go in and clean any of this information out, we want to make sure that we have a backup in case in case something doesn't go well. And, and I would suggest to you that anytime we do any system maintenance, you want to make sure that you do have a good backup. And we want to do it when the process is associated with the file, the particular file, uh, are running slowly or even fail to run. Okay? So let's take a look at where we're going to find this information. Now, how do we fix the problem? Well, we can go into the ES table index, and we can go in and delete the file. We can go into progression in System Manager, and we want to do an initialization. And you kind of want to be careful here, because one of the options is to initialize all files. My suggestion is you probably don't want to do that. I guarantee you don't want to do that, uh, unless you have a good backup and you want to, to, to restore the backup. And finally, you can go into the SQL tables and delete the contents of the table. You need to know where the files are. You need to know where the work tables are. And then you need to simply go in and delete the rows of, the, of information that are causing the problem. You'll be able to tell because when you're in the SQL content, you'll be able to see the null file, and that's all that should be in there. So if we're clearing work files in ES, we can go to the we can we can go to the uh, to the uh, table index and see all the different tables and the files that we want to get rid of, and we're able to empty those out. You'll notice that the ones I've highlighted here are all uh, are all empty. There's nothing in those files except for one. We could go down and, and delete the one for and delete the one for the. Uh, the uh, IMREWRK file, because there are 36 records in there right now. So we can actually go in using this, and we can delete it from here. And you get there from system, company, to the table list. So now that we're, going, now that we're able to do that here, let's go and take a look at where we would find that as far as progression is concerned. We're looking at system manager, under processes, initialize distribution, and select the inventory management files, order entry files, purchase order files, etc. In this instance, there are two pages. Normally what you're going to find as far as inventory is concerned, the work files are generally going to be on the second page. On the first page, and I don't show it here, but this is where you want to initialize all files. I would suggest that we not do that, and I think you're probably aware of why. We don't want to clear out all the files uh, unless specifically we know we want to do that and start from scratch. What we're going to do, so what we want to cover, what we have covered is the ability to reset our allocations. Allocations are built on the basis of, of all of our orders. So what reset allocations does, it actually goes in and zeroes out all of the allocations and then goes through all of the transactions and grabs the demand for that particular item for those particular items. Same thing happens for on order quantity. It goes in and deletes all of the quantities on order and goes through all of the orders whether purchase, production, pop orders, etc and gathers all of that information and then creates the on order quantity. This information is found uh, this information is found in those files and when we're done we're actually we actually have the allocations we need and we have the quantities on order that we need. When we're clearing work files, we make we make sure that we clear the work files and we can check those out on a regular basis. So I think that's pretty much what we need to talk about, and, and I do want to point the, the uh, processing piece again, the deferred processing. There's one more stage, and I don't have the slides for it. You need to go into the processing and make sure that you set that up. We showed the deferred printing portion. We also want to show the deferred processing portion as well. Select the same information, the date, the frequency, and what we want, the name of the, uh, the, name of the, uh, of the uh, transactions. Just in our instances, we would set it to reset for A or reset for O. And then we would make sure that we ran that. You can also print a list of the deferred printing, and you can also print a list of all the information and go to the report section and print the deferred reports that have been sent to a file. So I think I'm probably about, to, about done here. Again, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer those when we get to the end of the presentation. But I think what I'd like to do now is I think I'd like to turn this over to Charmaine. Charmaine, you ready? I'm set. Thank you, John. There you go. Okay, um, first topic for me is rebuilding the batch IDs. And we have batch IDs in all versions of Macola, in financial and in inventory. So next slide, John. Okay, 
Some of the um, causes of when you have an error condition in the batch IDs, which basically means you have extra batch IDs hanging out there that really don't have any transactions in them. Uh, the, the causes of this are where your the batch ID does not delete when the associated transactions have been processed or posted. Or they can also hang out there with a user who begins the creation of a batch and then crashes out or control a delete or you know, communication error. So that batch ID can hang out there and be there forever. And why this is a problem, a couple of reasons, is that if you have a user who is searching for open batches, it can return those old batch IDs that are actually empty. And this can cause panic. <laughs> they can say, oh, what's really supposed to be there? They're empty. What's going on? So that can cause concerns about the accuracy of the, the data in the software when really it's just an extra old batch ID that's hanging out there that should have been deleted by the system. Go ahead, John. Okay, so the rebuilding batch IDs in progression is found in both the financial modules as well as inventory management under processes. And then under processes, you will see the rebuild batch IDs option. And next slide, John, thanks. And in Macola ES, for AR and AP, the rebuild is found under system, utilities, financial, rebuild batch IDs. And for inventory, it's found under system, utilities, distribution, inventory management, rebuild batch IDs. And one thing to note is you can do the rebuild batch IDs anytime, um, even if there are active batch IDs. In other words, you have transactions that are unprocessed in these batches. You can go ahead and rebuild batch IDs because all that will, will happen is the system will rebuild the batch IDs. Those batch IDs will still be there. Any batch IDs that are empty where they have no associated transactions will be deleted. Okay, when do I rebuild batch IDs? Well, as I just stated, you can do it anytime, but as soon as you know there's a problem, you see a batch ID out there that you know you posted or you try to bring up the batch, there's nothing in it. It's an empty batch. You print it, there's nothing there. And you can rebuild batch IDs. So if you ever think, oh, is there a problem with the batch IDs? There seems to be extra ones. What should I do? Just go ahead and rebuild batch IDs. It's not going to hurt a thing. So if you have any questions on how to correct them, you know, go ahead and give us a call. Okay, the next topic that I'm going to be covering is removing phantom users. So what can cause phantom users? And this is uh, only in progression where we have phantom users. Any crash that happens in progression, um, an inadvertent, you know, exiting out of progression, um, this communication, um, error, a server interruption, power interruption, or um, someone using that red X in the upper right-hand corner instead of closing properly. So any illegal exit out of progression can cause a phantom user. So how do I fix or delete the phantom users? Well, let's go with why first, sorry. <laughs> uh, phantom users can lock tables. They can prevent access to screens or to maintenance. They can prevent procedures from successfully processing, like what John had discussed previously, the reset quantity on order and reset fully paid status in AP. Um, you can also create unwanted records in the MSL lock DB, which will cause unwanted records in the Mac open and or Mac lock table, which 
can then cause unwanted locking on tables and prevent access and round and round we go. And it can slow down processes and reports. Now let's go to how to fix. So what you can do is you can navigate to the users folder of your progression installation. Generally that root folder is called MacSQL, M-A-C-S-Q-L. The users folder will be right off of that Mac SQL folder. You can attempt to delete all files in this folder at any time. You'll find two files per usual per user. And and it, you can tell by the modified date, it'll be like a month ago or two months ago. And unless someone is keeping their machine logged on for that length of time to progression, you really shouldn't see them with that old of a date. So you can try to delete them all in the users folder. Any users who are actually still logged into progression won't be deleted. They will not allow them to be deleted. So you're not gonna boot anybody off kick anybody out, make anybody mad by deleting those files. Also, phantom users can create temporary screen files in your data folder. And this can, again, slow down processing, especially with the um, creation of screens or reports. You can fix this by navigating to the appropriate data folder. Uh, in progression, you have a separate data folder for each company or database that you're running. And you can go in and you can find all files that start with SCR for screen and end in TMP, and you can just delete those. The only caution is if there are users in the system while you're deleting these temporary screen files, if someone happens to have a screen open with the temp file, then you delete that file, you know, it can disappear on them, make them think that something crashed. So be careful, you know, probably better to do that with everyone out. Okay, when to delete these phantom users. You can do it when you're experiencing any crazy errors, uh, when the system is running slowly, after any power interruption, after a server communication error or interruption, as part of your normal month-end maintenance and before any system update. And remember, deleting this, you know, phantom users can be done at any time, even with users in progression. Okay, the next topic that I'll be, I'll be covering is file validation. And file validation works on all versions of Macola. It can be used to find any data issues in your database and verify data integrity. You can use it to prevent any future corruption in your database. And you can also use it to diagnose possible reasons for reports running slowly, for processes running slowly, try to speed up that system. How do I fix file validation errors? Well, that totally depends on the file you're running, the file validation against, and what error you're receiving. A couple of examples. If you run the file validation on the item master, or the IM ITM IDX, you can get an error that says description one, no entry in required field. So this means that in that item that's listed in your error, there's no description. So you can simply bring up that item in the item master and then key in a description. Another error is if you're running it on the inventory location file or the IMINB LOC, you can get the error that the inventory location item number, item not on file. So this means that the item number associated with that item location does not exist in the item master table. So how do I fix that? You can correct that by either creating the item in the item master, if the item is actually supposed to be in your items, or 
you can temporarily create that item in the item master, then delete the item location record that's causing the error, and then you can delete the item master that you just temporarily created. So as you can see from these two examples, the cause and the fix of these data er um, errors varies dramatically. So if you run a file validation and you need any help with what the error means, how do I fix it, go ahead and contact us and we'll be glad to help you out. So I think that's uh, what I have prepared here. We've answered um, who, what, where, why, when. <laughs> All right, thank you, John. Thank you, Charmaine. Uh, John, if you want to go to the next slide, I do want to uh, let everyone know that we do have two more upcoming webinars for this month. Um, next Thursday, we will be hosting a webinar with um, Sniperdyne, uh, discussing some of the biggest challenges that B2B companies face uh, with regards to e-commerce and sales and inventory management. Uh, and then the following Thursday on the 28th, uh, we'll be hosting another one of our McCola training webinars, uh, Managing Outside Processing in McCola uh, Manufacturing. Uh, so those two are coming up. Uh, we did have one question that came in over the uh, chat during the webinar. Um, asking about purging uh, the McCola system, which we did not cover today, but I just want to let everyone know, as I kind of mentioned uh, earlier in the introduction, that we are going to be doing a, an entire series of these webinars, uh, the, the webinars regarding keeping the McCola system running smoothly, and right now we do plan on covering that purging topic in the next webinar, which should be uh, February 11th, uh, so just keep your eyes peeled for that inv invitation. Um, at this time, we did have a few questions that came in over chat. Uh, John, if you want to go ahead and advance it to the last slide with um, our contact info, I will go ahead and we can start diving into the actual questions that came in over chat. Uh, the first one, um, gentlemen, I'd like to use deferred processing for MRP regeneration. Um, will that work? Uh, John, you might uh, want to jump in and handle that one. Yes, it will. Uh, as mentioned in the slide, it is that's one of the processes that a lot of individuals will use it for MRP because number one, it takes a it takes a fair amount of time, and it's best to do it when nobody else is in the system. All righty, another one for you, John. I think um, this person they use reorder advice report extensively. Uh, does incorrect allocations affect this report, or does this report operate independently of allocations? Nope, you're going to need, you actually, it doesn't operate independently. A reorder advice report does indicate that it does require that we have some sort of uh, information regarding the allocations that, that we need. So if I need to reorder something, I need to know that I need to reorder it. How do I find that out? We find that out by demand. And that demand can be by allocation or it can actually be, uh, be used and, and set up in the inventory item itself. Okay, and then let's see here. We had another person. They are having trouble creating a cycle count batch. The system is showing that a batch already exists for that location. Uh, will rebuild batch IDs fix this problem? Uh, Charmaine, I think that one falls under your domain. Unfortunately, no. That's not going to fix it. Yeah. If you can okay. get the, if you can get the name of that individual, uh, there's a there is a fix that that can be done if if in fact you can't delete the batch. Okay, there is a there is a, a, a SQL script that will help get rid of that. But try deleting the batch first or deleting the tags first. If that works fine, if it doesn't work, let us know. Get a hold of the name and we'll 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 get them the information to clear the batch so you can process. Okay. Uh, another one came in. Um, can we delete the many, and I think we have a typo here, so I'm actually going to open the phone lines, and uh, Steve uh, Bevis, we're going to get to your question right now if you want to ask that over the phone line. Just bear with me one second here. Uh, so yeah, the phone line should be open now. Steve, if you're out there, I know you just sent in a question over chat. Um, yeah. If you could just ask that question out loud. Okay, actually, I'm going to have uh, one of my programmers talk to you, Brandon. So here he is. 
in our portfolio Perfect. database, we have a bunch of aging distribution tables that keep building. Are those something that can be deleted? Yes, they can. Okay. We're not going to hurt anything by deleting any of them? <laughs> nope, not okay. at all. And there, you may also have GB Kamut, a bunch of those, and they can be deleted as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Kermit, sure. I just saw um, your question come up over chat. Kermit, are you still on the phone with us? Well, he has a question. Um, they are seeing a growing number of OE2 POX SQL tables in their progression database. Um, they, the question is, what are these, and they, can they be deleted? Uh, and then the same question for IM06PX SQL tables. What's the name? What's the, the the first table that you were talking about? OE2 P-O-X, uh, three X, X, X. It sounds like a work table, and nor normally that, uh, and I'd actually have to go in and, and uh, take a look at that. If you have X, 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 normally that means it's a, it's a, it's a work table, and when OE to P-O simply means I want to create a purchase order from order entry. Somehow that process may have gotten interrupted and the work files may still be there. Let me check that out. And Greg, if you could get the information, uh, if you can get Absolutely. the information, that would be perfect. If uh, if they're still in there, you actually can delete those as long as they're as long as it is a temporary work file. That means you must have there must have been a problem with, with the OE to PO process. Great. Yeah, and I will make sure that we get. Yeah. Go ahead, Charmaine. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, those are temporary tables that can be deleted or filed in. Yeah. Uh, Don Williams, um, he just had a question come over. Are there any specific processes that need to be run daily, weekly, monthly? In terms, Don, it's good, good, to, good to hear uh, hear that you put something in. Uh, basically, we talked about if you want to be able to have the allocations and quantity on order, you can run those processes, and you can run them daily. We have individuals who want to run them daily because they rely upon that information for their purchasing and order fulfillment. The other thing is, is there are probably a number of other ones. Uh, I'm trying to think right now, uh, Charmaine. That that would be the primary one. Uh, if you're running manufacturing, you might want to consider how often you run MRP. One of the things you're always going to want to do, probably, a, and it, so your cycle counting, depending on how you want to do that, you want to be able to, you can run that almost any time. As far as the process is concerned, though, I'm I'm not sure other than the reset allocations, reset on order quantities, which affects the affects both your purchase and in order fulfillment. Those are probably the only two I can think about. I think of right now. All righty. Uh, there's no other questions coming in over chat. If anyone has a question they'd just like to shout out, uh, don't be shy. Now's the time. Hi, I have a question. I sent it over to the wrong person. Um, when we're setting allocations, we've noticed that the OE order line quantity gets set to zero. Is that supposed to happen? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, we have a lot of background noise on the on the line. If you if you don't have a question, I just ask that you please self mute your phone so we don't get kind of overwhelmed by all the background noise. And I apologize if you could just please repeat your question um, so we can get get it answered for you. Sure. When resetting allocations, we've noticed that the OE order quantity is set to zero. Is that supposed to happen? Uh, are you able? Are you are you able to go into the OE order and see if the quantity is zero? What all we're really saying here is is that when we reset allocations and reset on order quantity, if we reset allocations, we're going through and zeroing out for that item all of the all of the allocation information for all the items that we've selected. Then what it does is it goes back and it goes to all the orders and picks up the line items for that transaction and puts that back into allocations. Now, one of the things you might want to do is you might want to might want to uh, might, might want to run a script that compares your OE order header to your OE order line files and find any find any orphan uh, orphan entries. That might be part of the issue as well. 
Okay, I'm pretty sure that they are allocated, that we have a quantity on the line when we run it, and then it actually sets it to a zero. I don't know if it helps or hurts that we are a multi-location, multi-bin, not imperialized on top of it all. Um, maybe that's an issue. I'm not sure. So, in the, so you're, what you're saying is in the order, the quantity, the quantity has changed to zero? That's correct. My question to you would be, do you have any in inventory? When you say order quantity or ship quantity? Quantity to ship has changed to zero. Uh, generally speaking, that means that you don't have any in inventory, so it's gone through and looked at all of your inventory, I believe, gone through and looked at all of your inventory and you don't have any to ship. Is okay, it back order? Do you, process, do, you, do you process it as a back order? Um, because one of the was, things that one of the things that resetting allocations resetting allocations and non order quantities does it not only change it don't, not only resets the allocations and non order quantities but also corrects your back order information as well. Uh, I can't answer that question right now. I want to say that it was a non back ordered allocated completely allocated order. We ended up with a negative allocation is what happened. So we were asked to reset allocations to resolve the issue and it actually changed the quantity and ship on the order line to zero. That's an interesting, uh, let me, could, if you could give Greg your information, uh, we could okay. actually get a hold of you and take a look at, uh, take a look at it in an in a, uh, in a, uh, online meeting environment if you like. Okay, um, and also okay. we were interested in the deferred printing for resetting allocations and what happens with the rollback transaction window? I'm s I, I'm sorry that rollback transaction. Yes, when we reset allocations for because now it's kitted on top of it, so for kitted items, okay. it will sometimes ask to roll back a transaction. I'm going to have to take a look at that. I actually I actually haven't seen okay. that. So uh, again, that's probably one of those things that we should take a look at uh, online. And if I just send this Q and A, or can I send that to all panelists? Actually, uh, if you, you Chris, could send, what you could do is send it to support at ativoconsulting.com if you like. Got it. Okay, thank you or, very Chris, much. You can, just, you can email me directly as well, greg, G-R-E-G, -E at ativoconsulting.com, and I'll make sure that we get someone, or to info at ativoconsulting.com, and I'll make sure that someone handles it for you. Okay, your email address one more time, I'm sorry. Greg, G-R-E-G, -E at ativoconsulting.com. Okay, thank you. Not a problem. Do we have any other any other questions? All right. Well, with that out of the way, um, just want to thank everyone for stopping by. Uh, your feedback really is important to us as far as you know what you'd like to see presented on future webinars. So please email us at the email that you see on the screen, info at ativoconsulting.com. We do listen to all feedback and we try to present topics that are of interest to the, the greater McCola community. Um, also, we know that everyone on this phone, uh, on this call is a McCola user, but maybe you have a, a nightmare customer or vendor who has outdated systems and software. We love referrals here, so please feel free to, to send their information our way and we'll see what we can do to help them out. Uh, with that said, again, thank you so much everyone for joining us on the call. Thank you especially to John and Charmaine for presenting today and enjoy the rest of your afternoon, folks. Take care.